Okay, today's 10 minute read will be reading pages 53, 54, and 55. And we will start with the bottom of page 52, which I did not finish last. Speaking out against the war, the Vietnam War was the first in which black soldiers were fully integrated into the armed forces. Although African Americans were just 11% of the total population in the United States, they made up 12.6% of American soldiers in Vietnam. This unequal gap was just one of Martin Luther King's concerns when he spoke out against the war. During an address on April the 4th, 1967 in New York City, he condemned the brutality of combat. He also questioned the wisdom of sending black soldiers to fight on the other side of the globe when they didn't even enjoy full citizenship at home. King was among the first civil rights leaders to oppose the war. Page 53, loving days. Marriage between people of different races was against the law in 17 states in 1967. To avoid trouble, interracial couples living in those states often had to live together in secret. Richard and Mildred Loving tried to do that after they got married in 1958, but Virginia police raided their home and arrested them. Convicted of a felony, the couple avoided jail by agreeing to leave the state. They moved to Washington, D.C., where they were often lonely and homesick. In 1964, Mildred Loving filed a court motion that eventually resulted in a Supreme Court case. On June 12, 1967, the High Court overturned the Loving's conviction. The justices ruled that the right couples to marry was constitutionally guaranteed. From civil rights to the Supreme Court, by 1967, Thurgood Marshall was no stranger to the Supreme Court. He had argued 32 cases before the court during his days as a civil rights lawyer. Since 1965, he had served as attorney general representing the U.S. government in the nation's highest court. Although he had, more, he had no more experience than most lawyers, he was still met with opposition when President Johnson nominated him to become a Supreme Court justice. On August 30th, after heated arguments, the Senate confirmed Marshall's nomination. He was sworn in two days later, becoming the first African-American in history to fill the prestigious post. Marshall served until his retirement in 1991. In recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. They're good, Marshall. Unrest in Newark and Detroit. Of the many uprisings that erupted across the country in 1967, the most devastating ones took place in Newark, New Jersey and Detroit, Michigan. In Newark, residents faced many tough conditions, including a shortage of jobs, poor schools, and inadequate housing. The riots began follow, following the arrest and beating of a cab driver. A crowd of 200 gathered outside the police station, and soon the streets were filled with rebels, vandals, and ordinary citizens upset by police brutality. The destruction continued for four days, leaving more than 1,000 police, uh, excuse me, 1,000 brutally, 1,000 injured and 26 dead. Wow. Newark suffered more than $10 million in property damage. A clash with police also ignited a riot in Detroit, where residents faced similarly difficult conditions. At the governor of Michigan's request, President Johnson sent in more than 2,000 army paratroopers to patrol the streets in tanks four days later. 43 people had been killed, another 7,000 had been arrested, and 1,400 buildings had been burned. A report commissioned by President Johnson, determined that 83 people had been killed and 1,800 injured during civil disorders in 1967. The majority of those wounded were African-American. Stokes and Hatcher. 
African Americans improved voting rights quickly led to the elections of several black politicians. Carl Stokes won the mayoral election in Cleveland, Ohio, and Richard Hatcher was victorious in Gary, Indiana. Both men were sworn into office on January the 1st, 1968. Fall of a King. On April the 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was shot to death while standing on a hotel balcony in Memphis. He was 39 years old. His murder was the third assassination of a major black figure within a five-year span, including those of Megger Evers and Malcolm X. Kings. Page 55. Malcolm X, uh, let's see, let's go back to here. Including those of Megger Evers, and Malcolm X King's loss was deeply felt in African-American communities across the country, some which erupted in anger and violence. Many also feared that his death signaled the end of peaceful protests and significant civil rights gains. King was, had anticipated that his work on behalf of the poor and oppressed might lead to his death. He asked that he be remembered as a drum major for justice, now widely regarded as one of the greatest African, excuse me, as one of the greatest American leaders, his birthday is celebrated as a national holiday every January. Shirley Chisholm. Until Shirley Chisholm, no African-American woman had ever been elected to Congress. Her victory in 1968 changed all that. Born in Brooklyn and raised for a decade in Barbados, Chisholm ran a daycare center and served as a state legislator before running for Congress. In the June general election, she scored an upset victory over James Farmer, the well-known former director of the Congress of Racial Equality. She went on to represent New York's 12th congressional district for seven terms. From 1969 to 1960, excuse me, to 1983, she co-founded the Congressional Black Caucus and fought tirelessly on behalf of women, health care, and children's needs, among other issues. In 2015, Chisholm was ordered, excuse me, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom posthumously, meaning after her death. Olympic medals raised fist. During the Summer Olympics of 1968, the unrest felt in Black American communities spread all the way to Mexico City. Sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos were both members of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, OPHR. The group's mission involved exposing racial segregation in the United States and race, racism in sports in general. Although its proposed boycott of the Olympics never gained momentum, OPHR still managed to make its presence felt. When Smith and Carlos won medals in the 200-meter race, they mounted the medal platform wearing black socks instead of shoes. The socks, they later explained, were meant to symbolize black poverty. As the U.S. national anthem was played, each man bowed his head and raised a glove fist. Their fellow medalist, Peter Norman of Australia, wore an OPHR patch in support of their protest. Both American athletes were heavily criticized. They were allowed to keep their medals, but were expelled from the Olympic Games and sent home. Today, their Black Power salute is often praised as an act of courage. In 2005, a statue honoring the sprinters was installed on the campus of San Jose State University, where both men had attended school. And let's see, we have time for another page. Well, I'm going to save that for the next video. All right.